Excuse no me. problem. There we go. No problem. Right. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Coming out of the November meeting, um, obviously our past few meetings have been very governance heavy for obvious and important reasons uh, due to recent FAA rulemaking publication and such. And we decided going forward that it was important to introduce some other topics of interest to uh, the district membership uh, to try to lighten things up a little bit and bring some other topics uh, into the fold. So we had asked on the Facebook page what other topics members might be interested in. And one that I elected to key on for tonight's meeting was someone had asked, hey, how do we go about attracting more youth to the hobby and to our clubs? So I've put together a short presentation here, which is not at all meant to be all encompassing by any way. It's some ideas that um, I personally have used and experience in my uh, activities with clubs where we've had kid fly days and uh, similar events to introduce youth to the hobby and possibly get them interested in club membership. Um, and these are basically ideas that are talking points to start discussion, right? See what other ideas the other uh, participants in tonight's meeting might have to build off of some of the things that I'm going to talk about. Um, give you an opportunity to ask questions with the whole idea being how can we provide clubs a little bit of guidance and direction on how to go about reaching out into their communities, hosting events that attract uh, new members to their clubs. And really, while this particular presentation is gonna be focused on youth engagement, with some subtle changes, the architecture of this playbook could be applied to adult membership as well. So don't necessarily look at this purely through the lens of youth engagement. Adult engagement can be approached very much the same way. So I broke this down into three key pillars. In my mind, there's three things that you wanna keep in mind when planning for and executing an event to generate club awareness, club interest, club membership ultimately, right? So you wanna generate awareness, you wanna create an experience for the participants, both kids and their parents, and of equal importance, you wanna demonstrate accessibility. Accessibility to the technology, the hobby, the club, and so on. So those are kind of the three main topics that the conversation is gonna center around this evening. So when we talk about awareness, right? We want to make kids and their parents aware of the hobby. Why the parents? Very simply, they are key drivers in child participation. They often are gonna to have to finance the activity. They're gonna to have to provide transportation. They're gonna to have to chaperone. So getting them engaged, aware and interested is just as important as it is for the kids. So you need to go where the kids are in order to make them aware, aware of your club and aware of the hobby. So you can start out by reaching out to local scouting programs whether they be Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, Brownie Troops, Cub Scout Troops, right? All of these are fertile ground for kids that are involved in structure activity and are looking to build their knowledge and awareness of many different activities, right? And in fact, the Boy Scouts have an aviation merit badge, which has an AMA component that is included within the program for earning that badge. So that is a perfect segue to reach out to your local scout troops and say, hey, we wanna partner with you in order to help you fulfill an aviation merit badge and we want to expose your kids to the hobby, right? And what troop leader wouldn't want some outside help and support to help them with their programming for their troop, right? So in most cases, they would more than welcome your involvement and engagement with their troop to expose their kids 
to the hobby. So that's a great place to start. Similarly, if your community has any local boys or girls clubs, again, the people that lead these programs are looking for programming help, things to create uh, a variety and diversity in their programs for their kids. If you have local schools that have particular STEM or extracurricular programs like Destination Imagination, which is somewhat of a creativity and STEM oriented program, reach out to your local schools, see what programs they have, see what help they're looking for to help shape that programming that they offer, okay? Partner with local Civil Air Patrol squadrons. Many larger areas will have a local Civil Air Patrol squadron and a great way to get involved with the cadets in those programs is to partner with them and offer a uh, kids fly day opportunity that way. So here are a bunch of great ways to go about reaching out into the local community and generating that awareness. Andy? Yeah, Tom, if, if you would, uh, when you finish each section, uh, just ask us, ask if there's any questions sure. on the first one uh, or whatever. Uh, I was going to comment on that one before you moved on, uh, because we do do a number of programs and we've done them in the past, but I think we ought to bring them forward. You've got a great amount. You've got all the important ones out there. The only one I would add to that list is the robot, the schools offering robotic programs yep. that have worked for them in the past. Uh, they, they, they represent a good uh, opportunity because today most of those systems are similar to the systems we use. But go ahead. Yeah, Tell absolutely. Uh, the high school, the middle school robotics programs, these are kids that are used to working with radio controlled apparatus and a very natural extension, in, you know, with aero modeling. So another approach, get ingrained into the local community. Have your club participate in a community parade, right? Throw a few models in the back of a pickup truck so that you can static display them throughout the parade. Have flyers, if they permit it, that you can hand out to promote events. You're going to have a bunch of families with their kids attending these types of activities. It's a great place to generate that awareness as well, okay? Similarly, a booth at a community festival, is another way to get awareness and eyes on your club and on the hobby. Um, another element that I've had some experience with that I found to be great success, something that I had done with my old club back in Chicago, was partner with local car clubs, right? And exhibit, if you can, at their shows, right? They'll often have cruise nights or have uh, car shows associated with local restaurants or other uh, local businesses, and while they're exhibiting their cars, ask for some space so that you can do a static exhibit of the airplanes, right? Again, parents are bringing kids to car shows, right? These are people that are, are mechanically interested and inclined people. And much like the car enthusiasts and airplane enthusiasts, these are guys that love to show off their toys and talk about their, their cars, their airplanes, their hobby. So the two dovetail very nicely with each other. And it's another opportunity to be able to partner with somebody and get out into the community. Yeah. If you are in a town that happens to have a local municipal airport nearby and they do an open house of some type each year, partner with them that way as well and introduce a model aviation component associated, you know, associated with the full scale component. So here's a bunch of different venues, be it scholastic or be it community based that you can reach out to to create awareness for the hobby and awareness for your clubs, right? So that's where it starts, getting the word out, okay? Yeah, excellent, excellent. And uh, the only thing I might add to that is, uh, is the fairs, uh, the balloon festivals, some of those things we've engaged in in the past, and certainly Darren's aware of, and so are you, Tom, uh, the aviation aspect of where we do it with the air shows. That's become very popular with us. Yep. But I like it that you've got that all organized together. Uh, I think it's uh, a terrific job on it. Go ahead. Yeah. And then as you try to promote these events and these activities, Focus on the educational aspect as much as the entertainment aspect associated with modeling, right? It's not all about the flying. 
Talk a little bit about the science. Emphasize that engagement in the hobby involves being organized, being prepared, um, having a structured mindset or learning to build a structured mindset in order to be successful. So if parents have kids that feel, boy, my son or my daughter could use a little bit of an activity that brings some more structure, some more discipline, some more organization, skill building into their lives, tout those aspects you know, associated with the hobby because it's a great tool to be able to help kids build those skills, okay? Hey, Tom. Yeah. Uh, John Yasimidis uh, offered a suggestion on the on the chat. John, why don't you just uh, highlight what you wrote? Oh yeah, I was saying uh, we we had done this last year, and, and that just happens to be the perfect opportunity to do it again. We also threw a um, a uh, a picture of a model airplane crashed or a drone up on our local Facebook marketplace. Got a lot of interest of kids who got stuff for um, for Christmas, and they were looking for a place to learn how to do it without breaking it. So it's not just for kids, for big kids. And uh, there's a ton of people on the Facebook marketplace when you, you know, that join up in the local stuff. So that's an individual club thing. And, you know, if you, whether you want to take a kid with a drone and show them, you know, what, what they do, how to do it safely. And if they don't join, at least they're out in the field, uh, out in their neighborhoods and doing it right with a little bit of guidance. Um, or they get interested, like you say, in the kids in car shows, they're into mechanical stuff. Well, kids are usually are into drones or into just about anything, you know. Um, so that's uh, I figured I'd share that little tip. It, it worked. We got a, we got a few kids from that. Yeah, excellent. excellent. Yeah, John. John's bringing up in a point that uh, I try and make all the time, and it's one that we were talking about before the meeting officially started: is getting outside those uh, those club boundaries, getting out into the community media outlets, like marketplace the the places where the people we are trying to attract are they're not with us that's why we have to attract them so go out to where they are and and try and use some uh, out of the box thinking that's great john thanks the the other thing i would mention too is uh connect with the avps connect with me if you're intending to do events even though your clubs have great ideas and what uh, tom has presented here is terrific and what we're going to see uh, more of that as he goes along, but we can't provide, and we often do, the pamphlets, the magazines, the handouts, a sheet that indicates everything on one page that we find that we hand out at most of the uh, aviation air shows that we do. We can give you the magazines from AMA. You let me know beforehand, and I'll put together a package. When we do our events, we bring baskets. We have them right on the table. We introduce the parents to what we're doing, and we give them something as a takeaway to take and leave with, which our, uh, you know, our, our one-page info sheet takes them to the website, tells them about trust, tells them about registration, and does all those kinds of things. We have them. Don't do them again. Come, collect them from us, and do the job using some of the stuff that's already available. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Go ahead. Yeah. Mark. I uh, uh, let's jump back. I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to say one more chat here for for Tom before uh, you go uh, from George Mack. Uh, he uh, he he emphasizes that uh, we're doing a lot of indoor flying, so don't let that detract from uh, getting people into the gyms and and using. Uh, usually, we're using uh, slow and uh, um, very easy to fly uh, models in these gyms. So you know, and invite a a friend from the neighborhood and their kids uh, to come along with you. Um, that would be a great idea. Is that what you were going to do, John? Uh, highlight that? Yeah, I saw Thanks. it, and I was going to mention yep. that. Yeah, thank you, Good job, Judge. All right, all right, Tom. Yeah, so so I I think all of you guys hit on the key point, which is you can't just throw a sign out on the road by the club entrance saying "Come try flying" and expect people to show up in droves. Right? You need to go out and you need to spread the message. You can't be. Um, that doesn't work too, though. No. I just want to put that out there. We do no, that too. It does. It does work. But I think to get the type of involvement and response and numbers that you're looking for, you want to go out and campaign and solicit in addition to those types of things. No question about it. So once you decide you're going to do an event and you want to get the word out, it's important to truly create an experience, right? If the day solely consists of showing up at the field and getting five minutes on a buddy box and then that's it, 
you got to question how memorable that's going to be. And if you're really going to create the community type of environment that you want your prospective parents and kids to see in your club, right? So you got to make it multifaceted, right? So in addition to doing the buddy box stuff, the photo here is from a gentleman named Todd, Todd Colbertson from my old club back in Chicago. And he puts a really nice display together that shows the guts and the mechanics of our models and how they work, right? So show the physics of how aircraft fly as kids are getting prepared to get their turn on the buddy box, right? Show how models function, how their structure works, how they're built. Give the kids simulator experiences ahead of that time on the flight line. Similarly, give them that ground school crash course, the ABCs that they'll want to learn and understand before they get their hands on the controls. Have static displays ready and available to go to show people the entire spectrum of the hobby, not just the trainer airplanes, but also the high-end elite stuff as well, because it shows people the wide range that the hobby offers and it can be aspirational. Like, hey, this is something you can work up towards. And I think that can be really exciting uh, and encouraging for the kids. Tom, Eric, Eric Tom, looks we got like two, yeah, two hands up, Eric, and then uh, Wingbusters. I forgot your first name. I'm sorry. <laughs> Bob, Bob. So great. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tom. Great presentation. Just want to insert a couple of comments. I think there was a person or two that maybe had some feedback. Uh, all, all great suggestions. You have to remember, these are all incremental activities. You can't expect that <clears throat> doing such an activity that you're gonna all of a sudden have three, four or five new members. That would be great. In the rare instance that may happen, but it's incremental. What does it mean? It means you're getting the word out there. It means that if the person you're talking to today in an event, they might not join or be interested, but you know what? They may be talking to their neighbor and that's how it works. And you can't have the grapevine work for you unless you start that communication. Uh, one of the first lessons I learned uh, many years ago in business is a business with a, no signs is a sign of no business. So that means if you're not out there talking to people, showing them, uh, being at these events, well, then they don't even know you exist. And the last thing I want to say is all these are great, uh, wonderful stuff we're covering here. One thing I would add, though, is to remember that your audiences have very specific. So I'm sure you can appreciate, you know, if you're talking to an eight-year-old or a 13-year-old versus a 20-year-old or a 60-year-old, they all have different ideas in their mind, different passions, different needs, a different whatever, right? And you have to learn to talk in their tones and be understanding them, in particular the kids, right? Because we all remember being kids and uh, we, our parents didn't like our music or activities or what we were doing. So we have to listen to them and uh, can be, we, cause we, they will get into model aviation on their terms, not our terms, their terms. So we have to translate whatever their terms are, whatever their thoughts are into model aviation and incorporate that in their lives. But that's enough for me now. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to be in this call. Great stuff. Thanks, Eric. What I try and tell people is you don't have to see the full forest to plant the seed. Um, and yes. we have a lot of clubs and members that think that they said, oh, these kids came by and they never came back. But like you like you express, you never know what's happening at home, what's happening in school, what's happening in the neighborhood. You got to take the time to plant those seeds when you have the opportunity. Uh, Wingbusters is next. Uh, OK, good enough. Um, that is exactly what my club used to do back uh, before we had to change fields. And let me tell you how we did it. I'll, I'll make this a quick snapshot. And what we would do is uh, we uh, it cost us about 500 bucks. So you have to put that into your club budget. But we planned this originally as just a way of saying thank you to the neighbors for letting us fly out at, at our old field. And we throw on a grill, we'd uh, grill hot dogs. And what we did is we would start any students off with a ground school show them a small RC airplane, uh, give, put a transmitter in their hands, let them see how it worked. It was only uh, maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And if you were a, you know, a younger kid, we'd give them a little, we'd take an address label and make a, a something that would say pilot on it for the, for the kid to wear on his shirt. 
then we send them over to the flight line and we'd have four or five guys there um, and they'd all have buddy boxes and we would have one guy who would just sit there and act like a traffic cop and just as the kids came by he'd put them with this pilot or that pilot or whatever uh, so that all the kids got some flight time but you need that organization out there um, the one downside to this whole thing is uh, you probably want to put all your nice models out in one area, maybe involve the public by having them vote for favorite model or whatever. But if someone is showing some interest, do not let them think that these are the typical models that they're going to fly because the people are immediately going to get discouraged and say, I'll, I'll never build anything like that. I know because I made that mistake. And I should have emphasized that, you know, pointing out to all the trainers that were out on the field, uh, I should have said, this is what you're going to start with. And then you say, you know, and there's the camaraderie and all this other stuff. But in a snapshot, that's about what we did. And we'd have it in June, uh, not on Father's Day. Um, I think it was the third Sunday in June. So just make sure it doesn't interfere with some other holiday. But that, in a snapshot, um, is uh, how we used to do it. If you have any other questions, you see my name there, N1EDM. It's my ham call, call sign at Comcast.net. Uh, throw an email my way. I'll be able to explain, uh, you know, answer any questions you might have. <coughs> and with that, I'll uh, go back to the mute button. You know, one of one of the areas that we found most important that I, that I should bring up is is the parents. If you have an open event, you want to influence the parents. And the best way that we found to do that is to provide them with material, to talk to them when they're with the children, to tell them about our scholarship programs, to let them know that entering into and becoming an AMA member, if they're under 19 years of old, can is, is a good gamble for them because to get a scholarship within our programming is a lot easier than it might be because we have such a limited amount of people that do so. We've had scholarships as much as $9,000 given to people in our uh, district within the last few years and, uh, and as much as, and starting from 2000 going up. So uh, we, we also provide, so if any of you are thinking of running an event, we have a series of signage that we use at our major events uh, that's at uh, Wings and Wheels events and so forth, the airports. What those signs do when they're on stands that stand up, I can provide them for any of the clubs that are having events. They talk about uh, people like Neil Armstrong, Bert Rattan, the Ingenuity helicopters uh, that were flown on Mars. And we say to their parents, these people, the people that Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, Bert Rattan made the first aircraft to go 27,000 miles around the earth. Uh, with one fueling over a, a, over a six-week period. Uh, the ingenuity, the four engineers that designed that helicopter that flew on Mars, all of them and many were, more were AMA members. When we tell them that, we get them to see that it's more than just a hobby, that it's more than just a set of, of people having fun with a hobby and enjoying flying. So Andy, keep in mind want... that I have those documents, I have that signage, you can use it. You can borrow it. You can get it from Darren, me, or John Yasimides, and they can utilize it. So, Andy, Andy I just before you, I, that's a great uh, going backwards a little bit. Like you were just talking about, like bringing these people to the club. That's like important. We got to get in there before we move out of that topic. Um, and I, I don't know if we are going to move out of it, but as far as um, what to say to them when they show up. Um, Clubs should be prepared. Like we deal with it all the time and we still stumble like, oh, what kind of training should we buy? One train, one instructor says one thing, another says another. We sound a little confused and I've seen it happen at a club like ours and we teach every weekend. Is maybe like be a little prep, do a little prep work. If you're going to bring kids in and you don't know when they're going to show up, bring out a little template of like your local hobby shop, you know, a link to the AMA or make one of those barcodes that you can put up on your club sign that they could just scan and get all the information of the club and have be, have a little prepared. That'll go a long way. Like um, I, I don't I don't remember your first name from the Wing Busters. I know you're N1EDM. Um, have a little structure when you have them down there. Just you know, like 
just do a little prep work. Don't feel un don't be unorganized. I mean, it happens. It's okay, but um, that might go a long way. That in the future, if you get these guys to to show up, that's all I want to say. Uh, Bill's wife has been. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. What's your name? Denise. Denise, I'm sorry. Denise, you've been waiting with your hand up. And I just wanted to make sure, uh, I, I forgot your first name from Wingbusters. Your hand's still up. Did you have another question? If not, could you lower the hand? Uh, sorry, I was just looking at that. But one last comment. Another possible source is if you happen to have a local, um, what's the Air Force youth group there? Uh, Civil Air Patrol. Yeah, Civil Air Patrol, yeah. Other than that, consider my hand down. I'm looking for the button to do that now. <laughs> It's under reactions, okay. if you can find reactions. I'm yeah. sorry, Denise, go ahead. Not a problem. Um, I'm going to have to go here soon, but I just wanted to share a story that um, that uh, I know Mike Shaw knows very well, but our son, Paul, uh, started flying models when he was five with my husband. And he was very much ADHD. And the first time we took him to... Uh, a meet when he was nine years old, they didn't believe us that he was the actual pilot until they actually saw him fly. And he saved another pilot's plane that shouldn't have been where it was. Um, that's a long story. But anyway, um, I did want to mention that his dream was to be an a, um, Air Force pilot. And through our club, he met several people uh, one in particular, Al, who was a former pilot Navy. for Navy, I believe it was. And he mentored Paul, as well as a lot of these other pilots, um, very much. Uh, and then he also in high school or middle school, I forget which, had the opportunity to meet Tuskegee Airmen. Um, and then he went on from there he was in Civil Air Patrol. Then he went on from there to uh, a full, full ride ROTC scholarship in college, where he became an F-16 pilot after that. And now he's going on to be a, a commercial airline pilot. Um, so my dream has always been, and Mike knows that I've kind of dropped the ball on this for our club, but my, my intention was to um, try and get youth involved so that they can realize a dream and stay off drugs because it was because of the drugs, I mean, because of the model airplanes that he did not get involved in alcohol and drugs right. because he knew dad would not let him fly if he was doing any of that. Um, and he also learned how to build the mechanics of it. Um, so my dream is to really try and get parents and youth, not just boys, but girls too, involved in planes. And yes, I did try to fly and it was a bad experience. Um, <laughs> that's, an incredible story. That, that's awesome. I, so anyway, Denise, that's I, a I, great I story. That's a great story. And um, I just wanna let you know that your volunteer leadership has access to people who can do that mentoring. So reach back out to us. Um, I, I'm a career uh, pilot and an airline pilot. So I, I love the fact that um, uh, uh, the subject of your story is, is going to take up commercial aviation. We need seats filled. Um, <laughs> but we have, we have general aviation pilots. We have corporate pilots. We have military pilots. And we have access to all of them. So uh, we really need to emphasize our members reaching back to their volunteer district leadership because we have our fingers out to all those resources and uh -huh. we can we can connect the dots. Yeah, Darren, would you let Kyle respond because he's made some nice comments, but uh, he'd like to he might want to comment. That was my next that was my next uh, my next move, uh, Andy, is uh, Kyle's uh, put a couple of messages in the chat. And uh, Tom, after this one, I want you to be able to finish your presentation. Uh, we, we've got off on some great conversations with this, but I want you to be able to wrap up. So Kyle, why don't you just uh, uh, emphasize some of the stuff you put in the chat? Yeah, read it in the chat, guys. I want to hear from Tom. Okay. Read okay, so we'll, we'll keep clipping along. So those of us in the business world, Whenever we hear that we've been asked to attend a lunchtime meeting, the shoulders tend to slump a little bit, right? Till all of a sudden you find out they're going to feed you. 
and you're going to get lunch, right? That all of a sudden makes that lunchtime meeting a little bit more tolerable. So not dissimilarly, if you're going to host an event, especially one that might be an all-day thing, offer food up for the parents and for the kids. Make it a multifaceted experience, right? Um, if you can cook out, cook out, right? Make some hot dogs, make some hamburgers, offer some chips and drinks, whatever the case may be. If you're a field that doesn't permit any type of grills or barbecuing on premises, considering ordering box lunches from a local restaurant or something like that to be able to accommodate your participants, right? Give them an experience that'll be memorable and that they're not going to forget. So along with that, everybody loves to take home a prize if they can, right? So incorporate a raffle of some sort into your event, okay? See if you can get a local a hobby shop to perhaps donate a trainer airplane. Write Horizon Hobby or one of the other manufacturers directly. Tell them, hey, we're going to be hosting a, uh, a hobby awareness day uh, for uh, the local folks in our community, and we'd love to have a prize that we can raffle off to them. Um, I know Horizon in particular has come up big with a lot of clubs and events and making something available that can be raffled off. You can go beyond just an airplane and uh, incorporate or have multiple prizes in the form of perhaps a free season of club dues uh, for someone that may be interested in joining or a free season of AMA slash FAA dues, uh, as well as gift certificates to local hobby shops. So think out of the box on that front. Try to have a few things that you can raffle off. It will also help keep folks out at the field a little bit longer because they're going to want to stick around and see if they're a raffle winner. So um, it's great to incorporate that as well. And then incorporate those demo flights, right? Um, have plenty of trainer time in the air, but take that 10-minute break and let somebody put up that 35% aerobat or that giant scale warbird, right? Show them the spectrum of the hobby and get their imaginations turning, right? Get them to see something that they can aspire to grow into, right? That's what someone had mentioned earlier in the presentation, right? Don't just show them the high-end stuff. Don't just show them the trainer stuff. Show the entire spectrum and present it in a way that shows that progression from the trainer to the sport airplane to the scale airplane and so on so that people understand that it's not a hobby that you're going to top out on once you learn how to fly. I mean, I personally have been flying now for about 20 years and every day is still a learning experience for me, as I'm sure it is for all of you. And that's something that you want to emphasize to the participants, that this is something where you're going to continue to grow and learn. It's not something that you're going to top out on in six months or a year. And then all of a sudden, everything is too easy and you get bored with it, right? So that's an important piece of the messaging there uh, on that front. Now, uh, there was a mention of costs associated with being able to put on an event like this, and not all clubs have the finances to be able to pull this off. But fortunately, AMA has a program that can provide you some assistance. They have the Take Off and Grow program, where they will provide grant assistance funds for clubs to be able to put on one of these events. And they will also have program information with suggestions and guides for going about uh, organizing and planning and then ultimately executing one of these events. And these grants can be as high as $1,000, although I would anticipate that most all of them that are awarded are less than that. But it shows that if you put a proposal together that really shows an involved first class event, you can likely get some money to help support the execution of such an event. So if it's uh, something your club might be willing to consider and you're interested in that grant money, you're going to want to act within the next six weeks or so, okay? Because the deadline for applying for one of these grants is February 1st. So if you've got a January club meeting coming up and this is something you might be willing to consider, start talking about it with your club officers um, at your meeting and make a decision as to whether or not you want to put a grant uh, proposal in place and apply um, to see if you can get some funds 
uh, from the AMA to help execute one of these events. And to give you an idea of the scale, in 2020, the AMA awarded over $56,000 worth of grants to the clubs that applied. Okay, so there's, there's opportunity for financial support there. You just need to plan it out, be prepared to take advantage of it. It, it is competitive. And what I recommend is that you contact your AVPs, contact any of them, contact me. And I frequently, I've reviewed hundreds of these applications over the years, and we can give you pointers on how to do a great application and, in, and increase your chances of getting a grant, whether it's a take off and grow grant or a grant for a club or whatever. So uh, in fact, it's, we don't have time now, but about the best take off and grant uh, application I've seen and come across in years is from our District 2 VP who's on this meeting tonight, Eric Williams. He did one for his club. And if you wanna see a, a template to, to utilize, to really show all the areas that you can cover. And I think Tom covered many of them, but how to present it in, the, in a tag application because they're scored based on uh, these, these different variables that uh, the scorers look at. Uh, I, I'll stick that up on the website, uh, Eric's uh, document, and, uh, you, he, and you'll be able to see it. Yeah, and, and the, the tag page on the AMA site goes into the scoring matrix so that you can look at that in advance and see exactly what parameters uh, the AMA staff is looking at when they're scoring those grant requests. Also, do not be afraid to come to me and ask me for funding. Uh, right now, our funding areas are down, and Eric can attest to that. We're about 30% down on a local district level from what I got, say, back in 2015. But we still have some dollars. And so the clubs that approach us first, when I go to a club and they're having an event, uh, I've done three this year, I bring a raffle item. They don't have to buy it. $400, $300 plane. I'll bring it in, put it on the table. All the money that I collect on that raffle from the AMA booth that we set up, Darren will tell you, we give it to the club. We give it to them to use for the cost of running the event or having the activity. And, uh, and that's helpful as well. So pamphlets, documents, uh, our presence, ask for our presence. The clubs that ask and we have available people, we'll send them out. We'll put up our booth and we'll help you with the event and we'll pay for the raffle items as well. Andy, put down February 5th on your calendar. <laughs> <laughs> Frozen finger fun fly, first one of the year. Yay. Eric, was there something you wanted to add before we moved on? Eric, where are you? He had his hand up, but he removed it. So maybe. sorry about. No, I'm here. I'm just, you know, high technology here for me. You know, I can't <laughs> yeah, <it's yours. laughs> mouth thing and everything at the same time. Tag, take off and grow. Great acronym internally. External, it's totally meaningless. It doesn't mean that much to the gym. What is a tag day? What you know? Uh, so here's what I would suggest, and what we've done at our club. Um, and there's a couple benefits to this. Call it an open house. That's fine. Tell the general public, open house, come on, learn to fly day, whatever. But if you use just a tag acronym or even take off and grow, well, you know, that, that, that can mean a lot of different things. So I would suggest that. Another thing, we tied in our regular fun fly day with a tag day. We made it the tag day. Why? Well, you know, some clubs are... Uh, have a hard time getting staffing, guys to help and so forth, women to help, you know, whatever members I should say. And so it's a little difficult. So just take what might be your open house and declare it the tag open house day, right? And the idea is you're trying to get people to come, put their fingers on the sticks, fly. It's also an opportunity to invite your local elected officials, the mayor, the town's uh, council people, whatever. Get them there. Show them what you're doing, right? Because they talk to people. They think about activities for youth and so forth. So think about it, you're positioning it. Again, think about your audience and what it means to them. And I don't know about any district, but I will tell you, I don't have enough clubs that apply for TAG grants. It's unfortunate. I wish more would. Uh, I'm sure Andy would be happy to answer any questions about it. I will too, in, in my district or for anyone. So it's money there, folks. Take advantage of it. Thanks, sir. Eric, we do a, um, a, a family uh, day and we brought it in with the National Model Aviation Day. I've done that twice now. And it's been a success because 
like you said, when you have other uh, specific others of the pilots, let's face it, most of them are men and their um, and their wives are there. When sure. a family comes and it happens to be a mom and dad and a child that's free flying and we give them food, it's already prepared. There's other people of their peers that they can relate with. Is oh, my husband likes this or my kid does that. And it's great. And, you know, it just, it works. So it's not just three old guys standing there with a transmitter. Okay. That's great. Sorry about that, but that's kind of what it's like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the last point that I wanted to cover in the prepared uh, content that I had for today is, is the last key pillar that I think is probably one of the most important. And someone had mentioned it earlier in the presentation about spending some time talking with the parents and giving them the context and uh, helping them understand that the hobby is probably more accessible than ever. Okay. Uh, because a lot of clubs say, well, you know what, we had one of these days, it was kind of a waste of time, we really didn't generate any member interest from it. But you got to ask yourself, did you not only promote the hobby and the club to the kids who are flying, but also the parents, right, and help them see the benefit and help them understand the accessibility and that it's not something that's overwhelming or something that they should have trepidation about wanting to get into, right? So you want to sell the accessibility of the hobby, right? The financial accessibility, right? Trainer ready to fly aircraft have never been more affordable than they are today, right? Electrics has eliminated the need for a bunch of field gear. It's never been easier to buy everything you need in one box, light assembly, plug in and charge some batteries, and you're ready to go to the field, right? It has, I mean, never before has it been quite as easy as it is today. So that's a key thing to sell and help people understand, right? You can buy so much of this product online now. If there's not a local hobby shop, if it's like, hey, I'm interested, but the, the closest hobby shop that sells this stuff is 45 miles away, right? You can buy it online and have it delivered to your front door, right? You don't necessarily need to go to a hobby shop. Now, obviously, if there are local shops, you want to try to partner with them and promote buying local, if at all possible. But if that's a barrier, depending upon where you're at geographically, you can go on Amazon, buy everything you need, and have it at your front door 48 hours later, right? So it's never been that easy. There's technical accessibility that also has been unparalleled before now, right? The way buddy boxes work make the training process safe and productive. Safe technology incorporated into many of these trainer airplanes make learning about it as easy as it can possibly be made today, right? These trainers their abundance of replacement and repair parts that if you can't get local, you can order directly from the manufacturer. So if you do have incidents, you can easily repair, replace needed parts, have the airplane ready to go in fairly short order, right? So you want to sell these, fat, these features and facets and help parents understand this is not a technically difficult endeavor to get involved with. Not like it was 30 40 years ago, where you had to buy a box of sticks, build it up, right? Have questionable radio technology that you hope would work reliably enough to where each flying session wasn't a crashing session to go along with it. Like the whole landscape, as every all of you guys know, the whole landscape has changed. And those are the things to sell, certainly to the parents, right? And then sell the community and the family accessibility aspect of it. If the flying field is fairly local, tout that, tout the convenience, tout that accessibility, show how this is a community-based or uh, uh, activity that brings people from the community and the surrounding communities together to practice the hobby together and have fun and show how it's a lifelong activity, right? It doesn't matter whether you're eight or 80, you can still fly. And if you learn as a youngster, it's something that you can continue to do for multiple generations. And it's something that you can give to your kids and give to your grandkids.
right? So it's truly a lifelong activity. So if you get involved, it's something that you can have for the rest of your life. So I think if you focus on these types of things, and as someone said earlier, prepare fact sheets in advance so that anybody that's talking to the families are all sharing the same message. Um, that's the way to most effectively communicate to your visitors to the field. And the goal you obviously want to have is for them to walk away going, wow, this was so much fun and it's much easier to get into and get involved with than I ever thought it would be, right? If you can sell those aspects, you've got the best chance of somebody saying, well, let's make a little bit of an investment in this and go for it. And that's probably, you know, some of the best ways that you can go about first generating that interest and excitement and then helping the families understand that the barriers to access and participate are not all that high. So that pretty much concludes what I had pre-prepared. And I know we've already started a lot of the conversation around this, but the idea was this to spur that discussion and sharing of ideas. I think before we get more into this topic, uh, in the interest of time, I know Kyle had some material that he wanted to present on AMA programming in this area. And I know Darren wanted to talk some more about the youth leadership uh, opportunities that we're trying to get uh, built up in the district. So we'll give those guys an opportunity to cover that material. And then whoever wants to hang out to discuss this any further certainly can do so. Tom, absolutely That's great. Job. Awesome yeah. job. Um, guys, uh, before I see a few people are, are uh, having to head out. I know we put this to 830. Obviously, we had some uh, we had some troll issues in the first half hour, unfortunately. So uh, this is all going to be accessible on the website at the Zoom page. Uh, I've linked it in the chat. Please take a look at the chat. If you have to run, please look through the chat because there's some great conversations in there that we've uh, emphasized, but there's some great ideas ideas in there and please access the uh, the uh, website page uh, all the meetings are in there and please share that with your club and other members uh, without further ado uh, John you got it you got your hand up there you got something quick yeah just quick I just want to say Tom's presentation was really nice and we were talking about being prepared when people come a lot of those bullets you have are sell sell you know we're not selling this because we're trying to make money you know like a general sale we're selling it because we love it so just if we put a twist to what you wrote up, that could be almost the handout. Just take out sell and it's what you believe, really. It's like- yeah, and, and, it, and it's also breaking down the fear and the uncertainty, right? There, there's a lot of preconceptions and, and uncertainty around the hobby and getting involved. And if you can address those questions head on and help people understand that this is not as challenging and difficult as it appears on the surface. I think it, it goes a long way to helping alleviate parents' concerns about wanting to get involved. And it helps them realize, yeah, this is doable. This is not that difficult. I just need to be sure that my kid is committed and really interested in wanting to learn. And as long as they maintain that commitment, they're going to have success. And we're going to have this available as the PowerPoint and as a PDF uh, on the website for uh, reference for everybody. Because like John said, it makes an outstanding uh, checklist, <laughs> just yeah. the way it is. Exactly. Tom, Tom, there's oh. some guys here that we have in the group, like uh, Steve Gola. He, I mean, he's awesome in a crowd. He's really good. Not everybody's that good with it. So this is a little helping tool to get out there and like I said, to do the presentation. Uh, when they first talk to someone, you know, we heard earlier that someone's son was um, uh, several, suffered with ADD and he became a you know pilot, flying F-16s. I mean, those are amazing stories that if everything like that, we need to put all together. And I would love to have a testimonial from someone like her. That would be fantastic because we don't. Well, that, the, the photo on the first slide that I put on was our club president, along with a young man named Cooper Mello. And Cooper has ADHD problems himself. And that's why his dad wanted to get him involved in the hobby to help him build his confidence, to help him slow down a little and have to think a little bit more methodically and kind of decrease a little bit of the hyperactivity that he's had. And he, this, this guy could provide a testimonial as to how much being involved in the hobby has helped his son. And it's helped the young man build confidence, 
build socialization skills because he's socializing with the adult members in a way that he's never had to socialize with adults previously. So there are so many things that skills that you can gain and things that you can learn beyond the X's and O's of flying from being involved in the hobby. And this kid is an example of that. All right, guys, listen, uh, Kyle Jarris has been a saint and he's been very patient and uh, I want to give him the stage here and uh, get him on. I'm going to let him do all the talk in his own introduction because he does a better job than I can do. Kyle, you got the stage, buddy. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, thanks. Uh, I, I'll have to tell my wife I'm a saint now, so uh, <laughs> then, then she'll probably martyr me. So we'll see what happens there. Well, hey, guys, uh, I'm with the AMA. Tom, you did a great job on that presentation, man. So, you know, hats off to you. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll throw a few things in here uh, in my presentation that that really, quite frankly, can help uh, dovetail right into what you were talking about. Uh, so many great points. I will say really quickly, one of the uh, entities you guys should look for in your areas to uh, coordinate with is the uh, EAA, the Experimental Air Association chapters. You know, these guys are steeped in the tradition of aviation. Uh, they're building their own aircraft in, in many instances. Uh, they're doing young eagle flights. Uh, they have a lot of great programming uh, to include model aviation programming that, um, you know, they're always looking for AMA clubs to partner with. So I'm going to throw that out as one additional resource. Uh, but again, hats off to you, Tom. Great job. So uh, AMA Education Director Kyle Jarris. Uh, good to see you guys. I recognize some faces here, so thank you for the invitation. I'll try to move through fairly quickly, just knowing that we are over time. But um, if anybody ever has any questions for me outside of this conversation, uh, my contact information is going to be in this presentation. Uh, if you just get to education at modelaircraft.org, uh, email that to us. Those questions will filter down to me. So, um, you know, we're here to help you guys. Uh, so who's this guy? Who am I, right? So uh, I've been in model aviation since the mid 80s. I got started in free flight, um, moved into sailplanes, high start. Uh, I didn't have the money for those 049 engines. Uh, eventually got into it a little bit with some engine stuff, some uh, 40s, some 45s, um, and then um, kind of got into a little bit of everything. Uh, so I fly everything except for turbines. I uh, do EDFs, but uh, it's all fun, and I have a lot of fun doing it. Uh, I'm also, you know, doing some other things as well. Um, so if anybody flies paramotors, hit me up. Maybe we'll go fly together sometime. And there's my family in the top right. Uh, so th we built some stick 40s uh, over the COVID holiday, we'll call it. And uh, the boys got to go out to the field. Mary, my wife there, helped me build them as well. Uh, so it was a great family activity. So uh, I'm going to lead right into Model Aviation Student Clubs, um, which uh, these have been around for a while. Um, what it is is trying to offer students, primarily like middle, high school aged, uh, but it doesn't have to be associated with a school district. It can be a scouting group. It can be a uh, church group. Uh, it could just be a group of friends that want to develop a officially chartered club. And, and through this, of course, we offer low access to our uh, primary site insurance. Uh, we offer assistance uh, in the FAA FREA site identif identification area. Should those schools or districts or individuals want to come up with those? Obviously, we're helping out a lot with that. Uh, Gov team's doing a great job. Um, scholarship information, uh, insurance uh, AMA benefits like access to the digital magazine, all that stuff is there. Uh, and we also, um, we have university model aviation student clubs as well. So for those colleges, for those universities, uh, it's a great program. You know, normally uh, to, to get access to AMA as a member, $85 a year is the general uh, adult cost. Uh, for those uh, college students, we drop that down to the same price as our youth members, which is $15 per year, which is an amazing savings for them. Uh, it's kind of a nod to the fact that, you know, they're learning, they're growing, and we want to get them involved in this. Any questions on this slide before I move forward? Model Aviation Student Clubs and UMASKs. Seeing none, we're going to move on. So we got quick projects. One of the things Tom's talking about, and so eloquently put it, is, you know, you're not just going to go out there to an event and do stick time and then go away and expect them to come back, right? You need to give them opportunities to re-engage in this hobby to re-engage uh, in multiple different ways. So, you know, I, I will jump back and say really quickly, when someone comes to your field, when you're having a big event, that's awesome. Pour some resources into that, pour time, pour energy, but give them the next step. 
when they're there. Okay, you know what? In a month or, or in three weeks, we're going to be coming out here and we're going to have a beginner's class. And we're going to do this and we're going to do a quick project or we're going to have fun in, in this way, depending on you know who's showing up and who you think might be coming back. Um, but I, I will say that's one of the keys that so often people uh, tend to overlook. You know, we, well, we did this big event and we're going to do this big event next year and we'll see how it works out. Well, a big event is great. It's a great way to, to partner with the community. And I would always say partner with the community that's doing a bit already. But at the same time, have those small events, have those small opportunities to engage and have fun and build the community. So sorry, I'm like, I'm jumping all over Tom's stuff here because it was so good. So it's uh, uh, good stuff there. But one of those ways, again, sorry, quick projects. Uh, these are from pre-K all the way up through high school. Each one has a video that's associated with it to show how we develop this thing and build it. Uh, many of them have educational standards uh, that can go directly into classrooms or homeschool rooms that allow teachers to utilize model aviation in what they're teaching. Um, and they're also a lot of fun <laughs> and it's cheap. You know, it's not even the price of a, of a trainer. You know, you're looking at a couple hundred bucks for a trainer system and, you know, ready to go out the door for, for a few sheets of paper you can really engage in learning opportunities that are fun and engaging, uh, which is why free flight is so awesome to introduce people to modeling along with all the others. Any questions on quick projects before I move on? Cool, there's a free to download, free to, free to access. They're not behind any membership wall. If you know an educator or a grandparent, or you just wanna have a fun activity at your next club uh, meeting, there's some really good stuff there. So we've got uh, AeroLab. So quick projects are a great way to do individualized quick hits of model aviation in classrooms and for fun stuff. But if someone really wants to jump into this and really go from point A all the way through the process, we have AeroLab, which is uh, K through 12, and it really provides that framework and that stair-step approach for educators specifically. Now, that's not to say that someone can't pull from those quick or from those AeroLab projects and you know use them one off. But if you're looking for an entire system, that's a great way to do it, and it's all available at uh, amaflightschool.org. Um, we also have some free Alcoa kits for educators. Now, that's specifically for educators, but I'll be honest. There are clubs out there doing just as good a job of educating when it comes to model aviation as are our teachers, right? So if you're a teacher, awesome. I don't care if you're in a classroom or if you're in the club room. So let me know. We can get you access to the uh, basically everything that you see in the bottom of that screen, the, the AMA Alpha, the AMA Beta, uh, the Gwilla's gliders, the pylon kit, the DVDs, all that stuff, you know, all the lesson plans free and accessible available to you guys. Uh, I think I still have around 80 of those kits to pass out from that grant. So hit me up. Um, any questions on any of that so far? Awesome. I'm either doing my job or most people have checked out already. <laughs> okay, so we've got two camps. We've got our AMA Junior Camp and I'm gonna start with that one because it's the most accessible. Um, AMA Junior Camp was developed uh, when we had to cancel our in-person Camp AMA. And I was really sick and tired of saying, no, we're canceling, no, we're canceling, no, we're not doing that, we can't do it, COVID-19 sucks. So what we did is said, you know what? We're inviting everybody. So from kindergarten all the way up through like seventh grade, we developed these projects. It was a week-long activity. We did them live, we recorded them. Uh, we also did interviews with aviation professionals. Uh, and we packaged that all up into three separate camps. So we did it for three years. Those are all free. They're available. All the videos, all the resources, all the interviews, all the instructions, templates, everything. It's out there. Uh, now, of course, if you want to make life easy and you want to get all the uh, specialty equipment and whatnot um, sent directly to your door, we have kits available. Unfortunately, I can't make those free but I, we made them as cheap as possible. Um, it's very similar to something you might get from one of the you know, monthly learning boxes, except we poured five, sometimes even six projects into this pack. Uh, we included all the tools, the hot glue guns, the hot glue, the, the consumables, as well as all the stuff that goes into it um, and have world-class interviews as part of it as well. I can't speak enough to how great these are. If we were selling these boxes like as a money-making opportunity, that'd be around 
at six or seven hundred dollars a box. I'm I'm not kidding, uh, and and it's what people pay for some of those you know make the IO kind of stuff. Uh, we sell these for under a hundred, uh, so it's a great way to get into it. Um, and then, hey, we've got Camp AMA. I, I, I'll always, you know, speak the praises of Camp AMA. There's something to, uh, as a young individual, going away from home for a week and fully immersing yourself in model aviation. And, um, you know, today's Camp AMA is not just an opportunity to get together uh, with people who are similarly experts in their field, which is typically 3D flying. There's nothing wrong with 3D flying. 3D flying is really cool. But we've really tried to take this uh, Camp AMA journey into something that is more STEM and STEAM related. You know, it has some educational components. They have challenges that they have to do. They are flying control line. They're uh, flying rockets. They're flying high start launch gliders. They're doing sailplanes. They're doing builds. Uh, they're flying um, World War I biplanes, you know, Balsa USA uh, kits that, that we've got available to them. You know, so we're really trying to showcase all that the aviation community has to offer uh, in as much as we can with five days of flying, right? The weather sometimes throws a wrench, but it's a great opportunity. Uh, we do that every summer. We uh, invite up to 34 slots, I think is what we have available for youth uh, from around the nation. Um, the only prerequisite is they have to know how to fly safely already in a club setting. So um, that could mean if you know somebody that flies but doesn't really do it at a club, that's okay. Teach them to fly at a club field, what the safety lines are, you know, what the pits area is, some of those offsets, just educate them uh, because with with our instructors and our mentors, we don't have enough to be one-on-one -on -one with students. So we really do have to trust that they know some of those safety guidelines. But outside of that, we do have beginners uh, and we have experts and everything in between. And, um, you know, everyone walks away learning something and having some new experiences. Do you have enough help Questions for that? about either of those. Yeah, I was wondering, do you have enough help for those camps? I mean, um, you have any volunteers for that? Uh, on occasion, we do utilize volunteers. Of course, there's a little bit of a background process and screening. Um, we also, uh, let's see, last year we had Santiago Perez and Ethan Ader come in as our official uh, instructors. Uh, we always try to find someone who uh, a lot of the youth know and want to emulate and follow. Uh, but we definitely uh, do have opportunities to bring in volunteers. Um, so, yeah, hit me up, John, um, if you've got some interest in potentially doing that. Uh, the director is Kyle Thede, uh, who's on our AMA education staff. Uh, I can definitely pass that along to him and we'll have conversations. And uh, really, a lot of it depends on how many youth we end up having at, at camp. You know, if it's 20, we don't need as much help. If it's 34, God help me, <laughs> because it used to be a lot of students, but it's a lot of fun, too. Any other questions on that one? All right, I'll move on. So we've got uh, one of the things that we that we utilize to really bring people into this model aviation fold is through competition. Um, you know, there's a lot of different robotics competitions, robotics clubs. Um, you know, and and they're they're all great in their own ways. And we actually. Uh, we know that we're not the be all and end all of the competition. We uh, advertise others that are doing great work. You know, the AMA education team is not large enough to remake every wheel that's already out there rolling, right? Uh, so we do uh, have a lot of those. And you can go online uh, and look at some of our STEAM partners and see some of those other programs. But we do have a couple that we do run. Uh, one of those is the Heavy Lift Challenge. Um, it uses a, a beginner trainer. Um, you know, it, it's teams of four plus a mentor. So very small team. So it doesn't require a whole lot of involvement. It's geared towards middle and high school students, but uh, it's, it's an opportunity to take that Aero Scout platform using the same electronics package that it comes with, uh, and then trying to see how much water they can carry, right? Uh, we worked with uh, Red Jensen over at NASA Armstrong Flight Research Center to uh, figure out that level playing field, whether someone's flying in Colorado or flying in Florida. You know, that air density does make a difference. So those are all parameters that we've you know, poured into this contest and uh, it works pretty well. <clears throat> uh, the nice thing about it too, is there's no travel. It's all uh, recorded and uh, the, the information is documented and then that's sent in to us. Uh, so teams don't have to travel. They don't have to worry about those kind of restrictions and those costs, quite frankly. So if you wanna know more about that one, hit me up. Any questions on that one in particular? Cool. Moving on. So we've got 
UAS for STEM. Um, hopefully you guys have heard of UAS for STEM before, but if not, I'll give you a really quick rundown. Uh, this started as a United States Navy program to get youth interested in drones. Uh, this is probably around nine years ago. So they ran it one year out of uh, uh, Puxatawney, I think, um, and uh, it, it went well. And then uh, the AMA uh, kind of heard about it, and we worked with Archie Stafford, and Archie kind of moved it over into an AMA program. So the AMA has been shepherding it ever since that first year. And uh, what it is is it's an opportunity for these students to get involved in uh, multi-rotors. Um, and what they do is they they purchase components from a specified class. Uh, you know, it's a spec class event. Uh, they build that drone. Uh, they learn to fly at line of sight. They learn to utilize GPS and automated flight patterns, search patterns, and uh, then they compete. Uh, now, there's two different levels of competition. One's for beginner, one's for advanced. The beginner is really about build the thing, fly it safely, do a search pattern, use your FPV feeds and, and fly it as such. The advanced though becomes a little bit more challenging in that some of these uh, teams are using AI, artificial intelligence to identify targets, land over those targets, pick them up, carrying them to different areas, dropping off different kinds of equipment. Um, it's a really neat competition. It's really amazing to see what the students do. And these are larger teams. These are up to 10 students on a team, plus the mentor. Uh, and there is a little bit of travel involved in this. Uh, eventually, those teams that are invited to participate in the international version uh, do have to travel to Air Venture in Wisconsin, in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, where we host those teams to compete during Air Venture. Uh, so they're sharing the same airspace as all the other pilots that are operating out of that area. Um, and if you've never been to Air Venture, um, just know that it's a very saturated environment. You know, we require these teams to know their safety uh, in and out. And also uh, they're a testament to what can be accomplished with drones um, in a more direct career pathway. But what we find too, is that these students build a drone, do this competition, and then get to see all the other aspects of the hobby and get into that as well. Uh, so it really works uh, nicely for us to do that. Uh, this year, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Skydio is our headline sponsor for this. Uh, they see a lot of value in this program and uh, have uh, stepped up to the plate to help us with it. Um, you probably can't read it. There's some social media icons in there that you might see on, on Facebook uh, talking about different students and different individuals who have been part of the program and speaking its praises. Um, Man, there was something like, oh, we're also partnering, uh, you know, the FAA and rightly so gets a bad rap sometimes when it comes to model aviation, right? I don't, I'm, <laughs> I'm not saying anything that's out of line there, but, you know, there's also a lot of good stuff that the FAA is doing and their AVSED, which is Aviation and Space Education, their team has really stepped up to the plate. They want to support this program. They want to support these students. Uh, in learning about model aviation, learning about the national airspace and doing it safely. So they're uh, volunteering some time uh, and, and uh, person power uh, to help us judge that competition this year. So hats off to the uh, FAA's AVSED team for helping us out with that. Um, man, that was a big overview of a pretty big program. Any questions on that one? Kyle, uh, any cost figures like, for example, to enter into the heavy lift challenge, uh, cost of UAS for STEM for, to get in, in, attendees involved. Yeah, yeah. So the heavy lift challenge is by far the cheapest. Uh, yeah. I believe it's $300. And then uh, depending on how many teams we have, the uh, awards for first, second, and third are, are quite a bit. I believe we have $3,000 set aside for that first, second, and third. Um, not each, I think, in total. <laughs> so now it's, I have to throw a, an asterisk by that and say that all depends on how many teams participate. It may be lower depending on, um, you know, we we want to have a, a good, healthy competition on that. Yeah. Uh, the UAS for STEM competition, I believe it's sitting right at $1,400 right now for a team. Uh, but I will say both of those programs include the ground school, uh, which is a pretty robust ground school that they have to complete before they really go into the actual flight operations, which ensures that they know that safety, they know how to do it. It's actually a scored comp you know, component to the competition where we look at each student's scores when it comes to that ground school to make sure they know what they're doing 
and can do it safely. What do you recommend? Uh, do you recommend that, uh, like some other districts do, that we're, we're kind of underfunded uh, for what we, we currently are doing, but uh, is it usually raised from uh, within the district funds and then uh, they, they send someone to say uh, one of the programs? Typically, when it comes to robotics programs, um, I know 1400 sounds like a lot, but for what this program is, that's actually not much. Um, so we're, we're very competitive in terms of what the costs are for that program. Uh, we find that most districts that send teams and create teams for that program are done through the schools, through high schools. We've had some middle schools that compete. We've even had some elementary schools, some fifth graders that have competed in this program, um, which we don't cut them any slack. And they've done some amazing work. And so it's it's really neat to see because we have a very broad range of youth that can participate by age in this program, UIS for STEM. Yeah. Um, some of these students are with us for years and years and years and get better and better and better. And then they create kind of a culture within their individual schools of this program. And, you know, some have binders that are that thick that go through, you know, lessons learned. Uh, and it's pretty neat to see. Are the, are, the, are the teachers applying for grant programs and then they take- There are some students? grants that go into this. Uh, Skydio has offered a few grants as well as part of this program. Um, and what we see too is returning teams, especially because of that ground school that we have is so robust for UAS for STEM. Um, if you guys are familiar with part 107 operations, you know, those students, if they turn 16 and they've gone through our ground school, they can take the, their part 107 test and pass no problem. And then we find that those students then are raising money for their team through their part 107 operations. So when a local realtor needs drone shots of this house that's going for sale, well, they'll call the high school and they'll send out students from their UAS for STEM team, do the job. Then, you know, the, that uh, realtor will, will cut a check to the team directly. Uh, and it works out really well. Where do we stand right now with uh, the new program where we're purchasing those small drones and we're going to provide them, uh, you know, uh, to the... To yeah, the so uh, I don't have a slide on this one, but uh, we, we went out and uh, we were able to uh, receive a grant through the FAA, um, through that AVSED team. Uh, it's actually the No Before You Fly uh, is, is the push where we receive those grants. Uh, and what we're doing is we're developing student drone kits with those. And uh, are you guys familiar with tiny whoops, small yeah. FPV kind of things? Um, one of the, the big names in tiny whoops, like the actual brand names, is uh, Newbie Drone. So we partnered with Newbie Drone to develop these kits. These are going to be sent to students all around the country. Um, they will build these things on their own. They don't come pre-assembled. They actually have to build. Now, no soldering. Uh, I didn't think we had enough time to teach soldering to, to students who've never even heard of what that is. Um, but uh, they, they will build it. They'll go through uh, a few different programs, lesson plans that are you know, directly tied to educational standards, um, and then um, be able to hopefully receive that same grant funding or more in the next two, three years. Are those, um, are they, are they FBV drones? Do they have God? Yeah. Yep. They, are. they don't have to be flown through FPV, but they are FPV capable. And that'll yeah. be part of the advanced drone stuff so that the, the teachers yeah. understand how that works, how that operates, how to legally do so, um, and uh, how to use it in the classroom. Well, that, oh, I, I see that you have, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. I see they have the, the various one. programs like the heavy lift, this one, this, this some other ones. Is there a video tied to each one of these that we could like basically look at the program because you can't really talk to them all? <laughs> so basically like a demonstration of the heavy lift that shows, you know, talks about the challenge and then it shows. Yeah, if you go to uasforstem.org, there's an FAQ section. The, the same is true for the heavy lift challenge. There's an FAQ. Uh, there's videos that are associated with that uh, okay. as well. So you can take a look at those. And um, yeah, really good stuff. Darren's going to tell me it's already on the District 1 page. But it may be it <laughs> <laughs> he very well might. <laughs> they, uh, they will be... Uh, part of this meeting though <laughs> they'll be linked part of this meeting uh kyle um uh, can you touch on the stuff that uh i've been beta testing and do we want to give a teaser for the other piece yet <laughs> yeah uh i can certainly do so so well and and tom you kind of mentioned this earlier too i think actually maybe john brought this up was 
know, when you do an event um, and bring people into Buddy Box, make sure that you have kind of a game plan and an in organization in place, right? Like that makes everybody happier, makes everything run smoother. Of course, it requires more manpower, right? But that's okay. Um, well, part of that is is understanding that, uh, well, how many here have heard of our intro pilot program? Okay, so I've got a few hands. Awesome. So I'm not going to go through the whole program, but basically it's a way for you to um, train individuals through a club, uh, through a dedicated intro pilot um, to bring new members into the fold, teach them to fly safely and appropriately and uh, get them into the skies uh, at no cost to them. They, they end up getting, um, I believe, 90 days of free AMA membership, uh, which includes the insurance as well. Uh, to get them through this first stage of learning to fly and really understanding if it's for them. We think it is. Uh, I think that's the, the same story for all of us. Uh, but, you know, it, it's a great way to introduce someone to the hobby. Instead of saying, okay, well, here's my handout, you know, give me some money uh, to do this thing that's really cool. We will say, okay, look, welcome to this, this club. You know, we highly recommend, we don't enforce the, you know, we don't tell people they have to do this, but we do recommend that clubs say, hey, if you're an intro pilot, we're going to not worry about your club dues for this 90 days. You know, get used to it. Be, become part of this community. Make some friends. Learn how to do this. And then when it, after your you know, 90 days is up, we'll talk then. Like, did you, did you feel like it was worth it? Did you have fun? You still have a plane that'll fly. Cool. Well, let's, let's, let's tackle this. Um, well, that intro pilot program, by design, is not set up so that you have to go through this checklist of do this, talk about this, talk about this. Like, that each club has their own, you know, well-defined, you know, process to bring people into the skies. So as long as they're doing it safely and following our safety code, we're not going to jump in and, and, you know, uh, wave the yardstick at anybody, right? Um, but at the same time, some clubs want to have that, that direction. Some intro pilots want to have that direction. And, you know, one of the things we were working with Darren on was really, it's a ground school portion for our intro pilot program. Um, we've developed that, um, you know, we've, we've been fine tuning it. We've, we've kind of beta tested it a bit. And I can certainly share a link to uh, get to that for the beta testing if anyone would like to see it. And honestly, you can use it now. It's a little slow and it's a little cumbersome to navigate, but it does function. Uh, but it goes through each of those, I believe there's eight different uh, stages of learning to fly through this ground school. Um, and so the intention is to do it with a mentor, with an intro pilot, so that you can go through lesson one and say, hey, I did this thing. I learned the, the vernacular. Cool. Now I can talk the talk, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Lesson two, you know, how do things even fly? Like, what is this magic sauce that makes something go into the air? Okay. We'll talk about that. Not in depth, but enough to let someone have a reasonably uh, coherent understanding of how things fly and what control surfaces are and how they, they function. And then we start getting into, okay, how to take off, how to look at the weather, how to pre-flight, how to post-flight, how to fly a pattern, you know, how to land, you know, the, the different things. Now, obviously, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you can go through this ground school and learn to fly. That's, that's the, the role of our intro pilots. What we want to do is provide uh, uh, a safe and, and reasonable approach for those who may want to codify that more and more directly. Um, now, of course, we know that we will have some people that say, I'm going to learn to fly and I'm going to use it this way and I don't need an intro pilot. We want to equip them as best as we can. Um, and I think that this helps to do that. But uh, at the end of the day, we lean on our intro pilots because I think that's the best way to get into the hobby. That's how I got into it. Um, so, you know, and I, I do think that there's so many nuances that go with, with flying that it just helps to have somebody there. Um, Kyle, as far as the intro pilot thing goes, I mean, I, I, you probably sounds like you're pretty heavily involved with it. I, I find a lot of guys have the intro pilot status. Someone will come up and they'll put them on a buddy box, but they don't go through the whole rigmarole of registering that pilot and start in the process. You know, it'd be nice if there was an app on your phone so we didn't have to go find a piece of paper in our trailer or whatnot. Get that process going. So they get that welcome package from the AMA saying, hey, thank you for joining the AMA uh, intro pilot program. Your date is here. And then when someone else, they go to another club and say, hey, geez, I see that you're already an intro pilot registered. You know, um, yeah. I don't see that all tied together. So maybe that's an opportunity that. Oh, definitely an opportunity. And I know that Alona and the clubs team, uh, they're the ones who who run that program is, is through clubs. Um, 
and they've been working for a while now on uh, making those tools easier, uh, making that club toolkit, if you were, if you will, uh, more easily accessible, recognized, and um, you know they've got a lot of work to do. Um, but I know that that work has already started. So a lot of times the first step of any journey is the toughest, right? But then you still got the journey ahead of you, even if you're moving forward. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not trying to throw more work in your lap, but just telling you why <laughs> we probably, you probably don't see it being utilized. It's like, Hey, there are these intro pilots, but I don't see a lot of applications coming in for pilots. It's not we, an easy process to, to get. Yeah, so if you, we should make it easier. And I think that that's the goal. Yeah, I think Pilot, introducing Pilot, a little bit of technology will go a long way to towards the IP instructors getting full utilization out of the features and the services that that program offers. Yeah. Recently, uh, recently, I began doing some research on existing programs. I do have some of the data, and I can make it available to any of the clubs that you, any of you, may be in. AOPA has an excellent program that they've developed for ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. Built into those programs are lessons plans for build and learning projects and demonstration projects. And it's publicly available at no cost. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to say to AMA and Kyle, sit down, you guys develop all of this. It's there and you can, they usually supply it for teachers. And, but if you go on the website and I have the link to the websites, have links to the programs for each grade level. I found them very interesting. They look at the five uh, different types of uh, theories on why we have lift. And they divide it down and say, hey, here's the real two, the two that work, and here's the ones that don't work. Now, here's some demonstrations and projects you can do with a hairdryer, with a vacuum cleaner, with a fan. And, and here's how you're going to prove which ones are the right ones. So they've done the work. The stuff's out there, but most people aren't aware of it. I will provide links to that and to some of the stuff that I've uh, gathered data on. So that may be of help as, as well. Kyle, thank you so much. Um, I don't know if anybody else uh, appreciated your, uh, your uh, using the first line of uh, that AMA uh, video with a little boy, uh, but that was, uh, that was good. I appreciated that. I use that all the time when I go to the schools. Um, uh, guys, uh, Geez, I'm sorry that it ran long, but it ran long with good content, um, and this is all going to be preserved uh, on the uh, on the Zoom page. Um, the the piece I wanted to talk about, and I'm not going to go into it in depth because I've got a document on the page already that describes it uh, right down the bottom here. Uh, nominees for Youth Advisory Board. Uh, we actually already have one uh, who has agreed. A 16 year old uh, Leo uh, Nordell, who's uh, he, he's a president of uh, NEPRO right now, uh, the Pylon Racing As Association in uh, uh, the Northeast. And uh, we're looking for more candidates. And if you want the, the short answer, it mimics the executive council. So there would be a youth uh, version of Andy. And they could hopefully, if we have enough, they could have their own youth AVPs. Um, that's the that's the the elevator explanation of it, but we're, we're looking for some candidates that we can, um, can we, we can look over and, and possibly start this throughout the country. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, district one has had a pretty good track record of, of the grassroots operations. So we'd like to have some more people come forward with uh with nominations uh in their clubs so if if there's a youth member that is uh out there that's into the hobby that uh, you think would make a good ambassador uh could uh be a good leader for other youth the whole idea is youth leading and youth teaching youth um, and they have a seat at the table they'll have a, a part in the process of developing district and national programming for their age group and they can help us learn what we're trying to learn right now is how to attract uh them uh to this hobby um and so uh put your thinking caps on uh, spread the word around uh we're looking for candidates uh sooner the better absolutely yes anyone else 
Anybody else have any questions about tonight? I know uh, it, it went long. Um, in the future, I guess, and I'm open to suggestions. I, I tried to open it up. <laughs> Learned my lesson there. Uh, the lowest common denominator took hold. Uh, so I guess we'll be using maybe a waiting room, uh, some kind of vetting prior to. There's been a couple people trying to get in, and I've told them that, you know, we had troll issues. So you're going to have to identify yourself as an AMA member or a club, something that we can discern uh, that they're going to get entry into the into the meeting. Um, I hate to do that uh, because it usually cuts down on our numbers. But uh, I don't want to deal with the crap we dealt with uh, for the first 20 minutes of this meeting. I, I actually, it was a plan. It was a planned attack. It was obvious that was the case. Uh, there were more than one uh, youth member involved. I, I don't want to place the blame on any of our current uh, CBO uh, of applicants or CBO uh, that have been uh, found as uh, and accepted as CBOs by the FAA, but um, uh, we're gonna keep our eye on it to see if any of this continues. Obviously, we all feel we have a place. There's more than enough room for us to coexist together with other CBOs and provide safety programming as we have done for 86 years uh, to continue to fly in a risk assessed area that's safe and and uh, with responsible flyers and our programming is really the gold standard and i think as people begin to fully recognize that looking at uh competitors that will soon be i think there's about eight different ones that have applied uh i don't know if i mentioned we've had 30 different clubs in our district uh, apply so far for free if you belong to a club that hasn't applied uh there's no rush but it, of course if you have questions about the application feel free to ask any one of us. We'll help you with through the process. Uh, if we can't get an answer, we'll go directly to the government officials and to our government affairs team or Ilona to see if uh, we're missing something. But pretty much most of the stuff, Eric and I and the other VPs, we've been through it. We've uh, looked at and reviewed so far 222 some different applicants. So we got a pretty good idea. I'm helping now three clubs with their uh, mapping, to show their uh, designated areas, creating a Google map and the locations for a polygon to identify the locations. And any of us can help them to do that. And as I said uh, earlier, this will not be all, you know, this isn't gonna happen until September 16th of uh, 2023, but we wanna get ourselves rolling in that direction. And, hey uh, Tom, I have a I have a question. Uh, Tom did the uh, polygon version of uh, the identification for your field. You didn't? No, I did the radius. Um, okay. The questionnaire said if you were going to be doing an irregular shape, that you would just click that to let the AMA know that that was your intention, and that someone from the AMA would get back in touch with you. Maybe we'll have to talk to Ilona, Andy, because, you know, you've been fielding them, so have I. Um, maybe a, a little demo uh, video, a short demo video on that yeah. would be useful because some, yeah. of the, some of the people are having difficulty doing that on Google Maps. Well, you know, my philosophy has always been uh, start at the bottom of the chain, come to us first, we're here, we represent the council. Usually, uh, Ilona is very good at this. She makes the connections and everything else. She's been with us one of the longest employees we've had on staff. But oftentimes, if it involves a modeling activity, she may not be aware of it. You have to realize when you connect with us, the advantage is we are modelers. We know things that staff may only have learned as a result of the vetting that they've done. But in many cases, uh, working together, you get a full picture of what's happening. Right, so I didn't want to- My didn't approach- wanna, You might have misunderstood. You might have misunderstood what I was getting at. Uh, I wanted to let her know to change the questionnaire so that it would direct it to the the, uh, okay. the districts for for guidance. In other words, I you know it, it's not a good idea just to click on it and let headquarters know. It's a, a better idea to click on a video from a district or something that gives them instructions on how to do it best. Because, like you said why are they doing it? Uh, Ilona might not know the reason we're trying to do that. And a club that I'm dealing with right now is they said, well, we have overfly issues with some of our runways and we have, you know, uh, issues with the airspace. So I said, you need to try and depict that as conservatively as you can. 
uh, in order to meet the needs. And uh, it, it can be a little technically tricky to do that on Google Maps. So I think uh, we should probably maybe uh, get somebody who's who's good at it to uh, do a demo uh, video that we can post. I, I, I think we can create one probably for the district ourselves. Yeah. Maybe others might want to use. Uh, usually we've been recommending to bounce it oh you know, to extend the boundaries on the polygon out 100 feet or more. Uh, you know, within within the we're still staying within the property that we we have permission to use. So our approach is not to enter into areas that isn't permitted areas that we've gained access to through the property owners, whether it's commercial, private, or uh, public property. So uh, we'll continue with that. I'm not sure that uh, I think that probably AMA headquarters can uh, derive much from what we do as well as what they have found out from going through so many of these. But I can tell you now, looking at the 222, I see a wide range of responses. I saw some clubs that were claiming to have flown a thousand flights per week. I don't know how they managed to do that. And I've seen others that average out about 100 to 200 flights uh, a week, which is more common from, you know, I belong to many clubs over my 100 years in the hobby. <laughs> Seems like 1950s, and I've seen uh, I've seen how we can overestimate uh, uh, the number of flights that we make. And typically, from looking at the clubs and 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 many of the clubs were people that were on our last meeting of the 30, which represents uh, you know nearly 29 percent of the clubs in our district. They uh, the clubs were that I saw the names of were clubs that were on our last meeting. So it seems like the meeting had an impact on them and they did use, utilize it to put their freer applications in. I'm gonna be looking to see what the change is from uh, 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 16 days ago. I think it's about that uh, when, I, when we last had a, uh, a count from Chad and I'm gonna see where we stand now. If it's pumped itself up quite a bit, uh, that's gonna make a determination as to whether or not we need to send a message out. You know, the, initially, Chad and uh, took the approach that, well, we got until 2000 and uh, September of 16th of 2023. But the fact of the matter is, where you come in on the timeline of when you apply isn't going to really make a difference because we don't know how the FAA is going to utilize and how we're going to supply that data to them. Remember, you cannot apply for a FRIA. It has to be through the CBO. And so what we've collected from you this, and, and is now there, including some other stuff that's going to be asked. Oh, by the way, Darren, I didn't mention that. I got an email from a club today that got another one of those emails from the FAA. So if you have a club that's receiving additional questions in a survey from the FAA, make it be known that six months ago, the FAA started to do this. Unfortunately, many of us were not told, uh, district VPs like myself. And all of a sudden we had members calling us and saying, is this bogus? Is this legitimate? And it was. I asked Tyler and Tyler said, yeah, we began this a while back. We, we, we regret that we didn't inform some of you guys, but knowing this, uh, yes, it's legitimate. Answer the survey. And here's where they're asking the questions they left out from the surveys that you've already answered. And that's questions relative to altitude, the most important. Are you in controlled airspace, uncontrolled airspace? What are the altitudes you're flying at? And other questions related to topics like that. I won't go through them, but I'll let you know, uh, or if anybody wants to see what that survey looked like, I've got a copy of it. Uh, they're not sending it to everybody, they're choosing. Uh, maybe they've done, I know of at least three clubs in District 1 that were asked to take the survey. So they may be doing a much smaller demographic and then going to use that to make some decisions. And maybe they're, they've, uh, they've set up sampling methods that will give them a good idea on how best to design the additional information they need. So a lot of things are going on in the background. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll try to keep everybody in District 1 up to date on those. 
Anything else, uh, Darren? Uh, or no. Anything? Does anybody else uh, have any uh, anything to say tonight? Uh, otherwise, I'll uh, I'll close the meeting out. Um, I want to thank you uh, all for coming, Tom. I want to thank you for the presentation you did. Uh, really appreciate that. Good Absolutely. job. Great, great job. And uh, these guys. I liked it so much. I think we need to get all the AVPs involved every week. And John Yasemides would be so happy because I'll do a hell of a lot less talking, John. I <laughs> um, is Kyle still here or did he have to leave? I think he jumped off. Yeah. I like okay. I like it when you're talking. Yep. Yeah. I don't blame it. Uh, you know, uh, we saw some uh, fairly new faces here. Uh, I think a couple of new faces here tonight, which is good. I hope you guys all got something out of it. Um, please uh, go to the website and the Zoom page. Uh, we'll have all these resources up there in the video soon. Um, and just to share it. Uh, share what you guys are doing in your clubs on the District 1 Facebook group. Um, we need to get the word out. Um, and uh, share your opinions. Um, don't be bashful about sharing your opinions there or email Andy, me, any of the AVPs. Let us know what's good, what's bad. If this is a waste of time, we don't want to do it either. Uh, I don't think it is. I think we've had some successful uh, conversations doing these meetings, and I think it's a, a valid uh, use of the media um, and, and the technology. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're volunteers, too. We love to fly. So uh, we don't want to be uh, doing uh, things that aren't going to be used or, or appreciated or uh, or used in benefit of the hobby or, or AMA. So let us know if it's yeah, a waste of and, time. And go back to your clubs and talk to your club members about what topics they're interested in. Right. Like we want to be sure that we're covering material that's beneficial for you guys and answering the question that your club members um, are most interested in wanting more information on. So in order to keep the topics each month relevant, it'd be great to have some more feedback about what kind of things we can be sharing information on that you guys see as beneficial. That sounds, that sounds, that sounds By the way, Darren, are you, I, I thought you were going to be in Myrtle Beach. I was. Uh, the, the flights were so crazy, we, we bagged it. There was a spinoff from all that storm. It was it was nuts. I didn't need to uh, participate or be part of the problem of that uh, crap show <laughs> that was going on. It looks like oh, good, well, good. What, eight, there's like ten people left here. Like, um, twelve people and uh, thirteen. Uh, yeah, twelve or thirteen. Yeah. So uh, you know, we're kind of preaching to just a few people now, but obviously we've had some. Like Tom said, we had some great topics. Um, I, one thing I really would like to see, and I didn't hear, I heard some testimonials tonight about how this hobby's helped them or helped the child and their family. I would really like to somehow get that out to all the clubs. Somehow, you know, how, how do we make them talk about their testimonials and get it written down? Because we do so many great things with this hobby, and that's why I'm involved. I'll be honest with you. I'm involved because uh, I'm not going to mention names have told me, come up to me and said, you know what, this has kept me out of jail or drugs, or I kept my kid away from this. Or, those are, and they don't talk about it. It's just a one-on-one -on -one thing. You guys do a great job. You're putting this stuff out on social media the same day it happens. You're running uh, streaming. I see it all the time. I don't get engaged because I'm saying, wow, what a good job. Why would I interfere? Well, that's, and, uh, that's part of the problem John's talking about. Out there, you do Andy, Andy. We yeah. need you and 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 everybody to get engaged. You're my I, delegates. I've delegated to you. No, yeah. no, that's, that's, not what it's, that's not what it's about. And John, if you if you find the answer, let me know, because I've literally gone on social media and begged. And, yeah, I mean, you and know, I just, I just did it the other day. I begged for comments. I told them where to comment. And what did I get? I got thumbs up and hearts. Yeah. Nobody but, commented. Yeah. Like, you know, I gotta, I gotta ask somebody to hit something here for a minute because I did something, Joel. I did a, something for you today that you may say to me, "Why'd you do that?" Well, a while back, you did say to me, "You'd be willing to help us out with the uh, uh, helicopter programming for large-scale helicopters." Yep. So they took part of your leader member uh, um, resume that you gave me, and I, I put in the key elements. And I mailed it out to the safety committee and Brandon. And so hopefully I'll hear tomorrow and they're gonna start moving on that. And where my knowledge is really lacking, 
I, you know, I'm hoping that you still have an interest in, 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 in helping out with that project. You got it. Okay. Thanks so much. I'm a lifer. I'm going to help in everything that I can. So. All right. So, sounds good. So if you get an email, I gave them your phone and email and, uh, and uh, of course, uh, you know, they're, they're now, they're looking to go to Ercha to try to get some input, input there. What we're yeah. talking about guys here is we have to do a, for the FAA, uh, the same program we have for LMA, for large model aircraft, over 55 pounds. We need to now supply one for helicopters. And I think we got one of the best people, right? And as an AVP here in District One, to uh, to work on that project as well. So uh, so you've got the heads up now. You can't start yelling at me. <laughs> There's always been a lot of talk of like, oh, you can't fly over 55 pounds. You you know, commercial as well as you know, yeah. it just there's a lot of bad information. And there's not a lot of uh, I wouldn't say bad information. There's just not a lot of information. Misinformation. Yeah, misinformation is what I want to say. So thank you for, uh, you know, we'll get that, get some of that stuff clarified as well. Um, I hope everybody had a nice Christmas. I kind of missed the introduction. Sorry, I joined a little late. Um, like I said, the crowd's dwindling down now, but I just wanted to thank everybody um, that I didn't say hello to. Have a great New Year's and stuff like that. I'm, and uh, that's it for me. A right, great, great meeting. Likewise. We have some good weather coming up in the next few days. Maybe everyone will get out to fly. I actually flew last Wednesday, which was amazing. Wow. Awesome. Yeah, latest I've flown ever. So, and Friday, Saturday, Sunday look like good weather. So I'm hoping to get some get some machines in there. So. Quite, quite a few clubs are having New Year's Day flies. I know uh, my Fremont club is having one up at the drag strip. So if anybody wants I, to come by. I heard it was supposed to rain. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, the last weather I saw was it supposed to rain in the early morning hours, but by about eight o'clock, it's supposed to clear up. Cool. So, so where are we where are we all meeting? Andy, <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. I'll be flying at the Quinnipoxa Club in Devon's Mass, so meet <laughs> me there. Or if you want to fly helicopters with me, come down to New England Heli Crew in Mansfield, and we can fly there. there Just let me know if you want to go there. Otherwise, I'll, I'll be flying uh, airplanes. We, we have our club fun fly as we do every year, whether it's 50 degrees or 50 below. So <laughs> yeah. we'll have, a, I'm sure, a pretty good-sized group out on Sunday, given that it's supposed to be yeah. in the 40s. Oh. Yeah. I'm more yeah. so... Take some pictures. Think about yeah, if you do I, fly. I if you do fly, please post it on the group so people I'll, know I'll about it. Photos and put a post up uh, by lunchtime. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, by the way, we did. We do have a meeting, uh, Darren. I, I just thought of it again. Uh, on the seventh, January seventh, uh, we're going to pursue. Uh, well, we're going to Gardner uh, to their board meeting uh, and see where we can go uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, seeing when we could have a district sponsored event this year, you know, one of our older, big time, bigger events. And, uh, and so we'll let you all know about the outcome of that meeting. Yeah. Andy, send me the details. I'm less than an hour from Gardner and I'd yeah, yeah, love to, to come out and at least yeah, be a fly out. Out. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think I'm going to meet Darren Potway if he's, everything's okay and yeah. everything okay with me. Uh, and then we're going to, uh, we're going to go and uh, see what they may be able to offer us and what we can uh, do to promote an event. And, uh, and that's, that, that's going to be one of our missions this year.